I'd like you to think about the word value, what the word value might mean to you. So put it in tangible terms now. What, maybe uh, what, what's the value of your home? Or what's the value of your golf clubs? Or maybe what's the value of something physical that you, you have and think about? So what's the value of that? Maybe just shift a little bit now and think in terms of what is, what is something valuable that's maybe a little less tangible, like a relationship. Maybe uh, the, the relationship you have with a spouse or your children. Or maybe from a business sense, the relationship you have with your employees or the people even in this, in this room. So that's the word value. That's going to be a big topic of us today, how to build value. So from a business sense, think about what you do every day and how that can relate to, do you do things every day that builds business value? And do, you know how to business, do you know how to build business value? Do you know what the kinds of things are that go into building this value. So that's going to be the main topic for our conversation today. But is it, do you define what the value is or do other people define what the value is? So that relationship or that tangible thing, is it what you define it as? Do you think it's a very strong, a lot of value to that relationship? And do the other people think it's a very strong value in, to that relationship? So who determines what's valuable? So we'll be trying to think of that as we go along as well. Um, from the business standpoint, we often think about enterprise value and book value and the market value. And that's really the topic of the conversation today. How are we going to get to understand what, those, what's, what makes our company valuable and those terms, how they relate to things we do every day. So the question is, do you know the value of your company today? Do you know the value of your company in relationship to other companies in your market segment? And do you know the value, uh, is, it going, the, is the value in general going up or going down? And the big question is, what drives that value? What are the things that you're doing every day that drives that value? So um, we're going to continue to talk about value drivers. And you may say, well, wait a minute, Marty. I'm, I'm not that concerned about value because you know, I'm, I'm not going to sell my company anytime soon. Or I might not even be in a position, I'm, I'm in a leadership position, but I might not even be the one who decides if I'm going to sell my company very soon. And so I'd say to that, that's not what we're here to talk about. What we're here to talk about is building long-term value. So, if you're going to sell your company tomorrow, you should be thinking about long-term value. If you're going to sell your company in a week from now, or two weeks from now, or a month from now, you should be thinking about how you build long-term value. If you're going to eventually move your company over to your employees, you should be thinking about building long-term value. If you're going to do an ESOP, or, or uh, uh, acquire other companies, or sell it to a big company, or maybe just run the company forever and ever and ever, your, your job as a CEO, as a leader, as a vice president, as a president, whatever your role in your company, you should be thinking about how do I build long-term value over and over and over. That should be your, sort of your, if you're thinking about how to build value in your relationships, which is probably something you do every day, you know, in your marriage, how do you, how do you increase your marital adjustment scores? That's building value there. And then so every day in your business, how do you drive the value in your business? Are you thinking about that stuff every day? What I found is most, most execs in the mid-market don't always think about that because what, what goes on in the mid-market? You know, our, our, our hair is really on fire on the uh, things that are going on all the time. We've got a million things going on. We're responsible for staff. We're responsible for customers. We're responsible for payroll. We're responsible for our new office space or our, our new benefits package. We're responsible for a ton of stuff. And then we don't always have the chance to sit down and think, are these the kind of things that are make us more valuable? I think that you're in this unique position, that you're running a small or mid-market company, and I think it's the most fabulous place in the world to be. I've been in your shoes. And I, I can't think of any other place that I'd rather be from a, what I'm doing with my life as a business. Now, maybe being a shortstop for the Yankees is a better spot. But if you can't have that job, you know, Derek Jeter, I think, still has that. If you can't have that job, I think a leadership role in the mid-market is just about the funnest thing you can do. But, you know, the odd thing about being in that spot is you, you always have these contradictions. You know, things are going pretty well, but you're not really sure what's around the corner in this economy and maybe what your customers are doing. You know, so you have these contradictions that many times seem hard to handle. Um, you've had some success in the past. You may even won a few things, but you're not really sure how you won that and can you do that again and again and again and again. You've built a pretty strong leadership team. You're pretty comfortable with these guys, these, these folks on your team, but including yourself, is that the right team to take your company to the next level? You know, you, you don't have to worry about some of the things that publicly traded companies have to worry about, like Sarbanes-Oxley and some of those governance things, but yet you don't really have any outside control or any governance to say, hey, indeed, you are on the right, right path, and you're sort of maintaining the controls that you need to maintain. 
So there's all sorts of positions you have that are contradictory. And so what I'd like to talk about is how to, how to begin to bring those points of contradiction into something that you can focus on, something you can really have a, have a good time with that's always about doing one thing, and that's building business value. I've been in your spot a number of different times, founded two different companies, I've been CEO of two different companies, and I've sold three different companies. Um, so it's not to say that I'm an expert in this area, but I've kind of gone through this before, and what I've come up with was a process that I call building business value, and it's one that's, uh, that I've kind of honed as an operator in your shoes. I've uh, thought through a lot as a, as in consulting projects, and then over the last few years, I've worked with 40 different CEOs to try to figure out if indeed this is the right kind of way for mid-market companies to go about their planning process. Because what you find in the planning process is you'll do things like go off-site and you do all sorts of stuff, and you'll suffer from what I call off-site euphoria, right? You have all these great ideas, and then, you, and then you come back to the office and you don't execute, or you, maybe you're executing on the sort of the wrong stuff. So what I'm going to do is take you through a process where we're going to begin to think about what you are today, a real honest assessment, a real hard, cold, transparent look of where you are today, um, and then talk about where you want to be in the next two, three, or four years, whatever your time frame is going to be, and then figure out how you're going to get there. That's pretty radical stuff, right? Where you are today, where you want to go, and how you're going to get there. Now, I've asked this question to a tons of people over the last four or five years, and I can honestly say that no company no company has ever been able to give me that answer. Where you are today, where you want to go, and how you're going to get there. Now, I'm not saying that a CEO or a president hasn't been able to tell me that, but no company as an entity, no leadership team has been able to tell me the same thing. CEO may tell me one thing, and the CFO may tell me another. The COO may tell me one thing, and the director of ops may tell me another. Uh, the CFO may say we're going this way, and then the people in the trenches have no idea on what we're going to do. So that's, that's what we're talking about, how to build consensus among all those folks to sort of get you in the right direction. So those big three steps, where your company is now, uh, where you want it to go, and how it's going to get there are the, the main three things for our conversation for the rest of the morning, the rest of the afternoon, excuse me. So the, the first things we want to do is sort of take this really honest assessment of where your company is now. We can't go anywhere if we don't have a really good feel for where we're going to go now. Um, if you're going to start a running program, if you don't know that you can run two miles, you can't sign up for a 10K training program and try to get that done in four weeks, right? You have to have a really good understanding of where you are today because we're going to build, build off of that. So I'm going to suggest four tools that your company can use, places you can sort of get anywhere after we talk about this. The first thing is a, is a valuation, a formal valuation. Now you say, what, what's a valuation? Well, it's a, it's a it's an outside company coming in and saying, this is the value, from the marketplace perspective, of your company. A lot of times people use this for fairness opinions, or stock options, or they may begin to consider buying somebody else, or they may be considering exiting the market. So you get a feel for what my value is today. And a lot of times what you'll find out is a company will say, I think my value is $2 million in the marketplace, or I think my value is $10 million in the marketplace. And a form of evaluation will say, well, I think you're on the wrong track here because you're really worth $500,000 or you're really worth $2.5 million. So you just want to get a ballpark feel of your value in the marketplace. And they usually give you a range when you do this. I don't do this for a living, but there's all sorts of companies out there that can do this. You, maybe even your accounting firms or the companies that you work with do that for a living. But it's a good idea to sort of get that baseline. This is sort of the beginning of our transparency, the beginning of our honesty as a company to say, this indeed is where we are. The second thing we're going to do, we're going to begin to do a self-assessment. And what I have up here is the, the assessment that I'll be happy to send to you, but it's an assessment of where you are as a company right now. We break it into two major categories, internal value drivers and external value drivers, and we rate them. So as a leadership team, I'd like your whole entire leadership team to begin to do this. And why not just you as the CEO or you as the president or you as the founder? Because many times you have this, this rose-colored glass look at your company, right? You may rate yourself quite high. You really want the input of your leadership team to say, indeed, where are we? And the idea is to begin to build consensus up. Uh, and the whole leadership team could, should do it for, for a couple reasons. The biggest reason, I think, comes from an African proverb. And the, and the line was, if you want to go somewhere fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So if you as a CEO, or you as a leader of your company, if you're the only one that sort of knows the secret sauce, you're the only one that sort of knows the assessment of your company, you're not really on great footing. You really want to get your entire leadership team comfortable with the current assessment of the company. You can't fix anything until you all buy in, your heads are all bobbing on the current assessment of the company. 
So we send this out and it's basically a fancy spreadsheet. And it begins to say, let's, let's rate our company uh, from a scale of 1 to 5. And there's 90 dimensions of value that you, you score. And we'll roll those all up in some aggregate, aggregate scores. And you're going to be able to, you're going to score it on 5 as you far exceeds the industry standards and you're surpassing any stretch goals you may have. In other words, you're setting the industry standard in this particular part of your business. You are the leader. You're saying to yourself, I'm the leader in my industry in this part of my business. The other area is a little bit undefined. You might not even have information on it. You might not even know. It might not even apply to your company. Three is sort of industry standard, kind of in the average. You sort of meet expectations. You're doing the same thing with everybody else. So that's kind of the scale that we want to we do. And again, we want to get everybody, uh, all your leadership team, playing a part of this process to get the heads bobbing on the same, same level. Okay. Now the second tool, which is a net result of this, something we call a contour map. Um, the contour map is, is just really taking that spreadsheet and laying it in a different visual look. So there's an internal contour map and an external contour map. And we do this because why? We're building consensus among the leadership team that this is the status of our company. If you're like me, you, you, can, li you can really uh, buy into a, a graph like this because it's visually, I can, I can connect and I can say, ah, indeed, there's, there's ownership and legal issues and structural issues in our company that aren't strong. We need to see if, and they may not need to be strong, but they're not strong right now. The idea is you, you, you create a contour map that everyone agrees to. And that's the great dialogue on the, on the sessions when you have your whole leadership team having a discussion about, no, we're strong here, no, we're weak here, no, this is better here. So you may ask, you know, is it important to have to be a five all the way around? It's a great question to ask. The answer is not necessarily, depending on what drives value for your company and your marketplace. So I'll give you an example. I do some work with the University of Maryland Baltimore County Incubator, and there's a kind of a neat company up there that um, is working on an algorithm to lower the noise for signal to noise ratio for better communications. The people that invented that company are the same people that invented Doppler radar. So they've got some cool stuff. The most important thing for them is the protection of their asset base. Uh, they're going to they're license this technology. They're not that interested on creating a product around it or in having a sales force. They're really just worried about uh, making sure their asset base is protected. So they spend all sorts of money and doing all sorts of things around protection of their IP because they're scared to death that their, their whole company is based on one algorithm. So it's really important for them to have a five on asset base. Maybe not so important to have a, uh, have a five on business management where they can have good controls and good governance or, or good examples of project management. That's not that important to them. They need to be a five, a home run on asset base. So the whole leadership team needs to buy in that that's the investment that we're making. Uh, another example, Matt, we can flip to the next uh, slide. Another example is a company in DC that does work in the education field. They write education policy. So their customer are the staffers on Capitol Hill. So they're writing policy for these folks. The most important thing for that company was to be intimate with their customer base. I know some of your businesses, and I would say that intimacy with your customers is probably pretty important to your. So you need to have that intimacy with your customer base. And perhaps sales and channel management is not quite as important. So what you need to do as part of this exercise is sort of agree what are the most important things that drive value in your company and get the entire leadership team on board on that. So after we've done the, f after we've done the first way, we've done evaluation, we've done sort of a, a very honest and open assessment of our company. We've, be we've begun to build this contour map where we all begin to agree on where the strengths and weaknesses of our company are and then where we need to push this out. So the first time you do this, you're going to show a contour map like that. And then the next time you do it, you're going to stretch, you're going to agree that we need to stretch out here in market marketing or maybe we need to stretch out in customer support. And those are going to be their areas for your, potential areas for your investment. The next one is we're going to work out how we work. So the, uh, uh, the next chart we'll show is, is an organograph. If you've ever seen an organograph, or some of you that may know me, this is one of my favorite tools. An organograph maps out how you work, how you do business. And so we use these constructs. This was created by a fellow named Henry Mitzberg from the University of Toronto about 20 years ago. And he uses these constructs, constructs of webs and stars and tubes and funnels and different ways to represent how you work. So when we come across these exercises, we, we create a list of what's working and what's not working. So this is a professional services business, an IT services business that we did a number of years ago. This is what that company thought they looked like. Two major things for that company were recruiting and biz dev. So they decided if they're not doing, if they're, every strategic thing they're not doing around recruiting and biz dev, they're in the wrong game, right? They, everything they, were, they put everything they had in those two business areas, the two functions for their business. So we create out of this organograph a list of what's working and a list of what's not working. So we begin to catalog exactly how we're doing. So remember what we're doing, 
is we're, we know, we're trying to baseline where we are now, that real honest assessment, that brutal facts of where we are right now. Okay? Second thing we want to know is where do we go now? We have a good assessment of where we are. We face the brutal facts, warts and all. We sort of know what the company looks like. We know about our strengths and weaknesses. We've got the leadership team all buying into these are the things that drive value in our company, and these are the areas we're strong, and these are the areas that we're weak, and these are what we need working on. This is what, we need, this is what we're doing really well. So you've got that all done. Now you have to have that vision thing going on. You have to have that, where are we going to go from here? You got to really understand the next steps. So where we want to go from here is begin these, these exercises that help us visioneer the future. I would suggest that you go through an exercise that you begin to paint a picture. And it's back to that uh, uh, idea that you need to change, you need to get somewhere. Things are going to be a little difficult along the road, but you need to begin to paint a picture. So I suggest that companies use uh, allegorical or metaphorical views of maybe what the world might look like in a few years. I'm not so concerned with time constraints. People say, you know, show it two, three years, four years down the road. I don't think that's frankly important. I think what you need to do is begin to paint a picture, begin to draw a picture. And I'll give you some examples. Um, I just did one uh, this week, two days ago. And the company drew, um, familiar with plate tectonics, you know, the uh, concept of uh, shifting continents. Well, they, they had the idea that the continents had already shifted. They were stuck on one, but they needed to be on a couple others. And they drew these oak forests because it was a very stable world on, the, on continent number one, but somehow they needed to get through the oceans and get across the oceans to get to new areas. And it might sound a little silly, and the first time you do it, you say, gosh, I can't draw like that. I, you know, my leadership team can draw like that. But what it draws out from you, what it brings out from the entire leadership team, is the dialogue. Why, why would we be going to another continent? Why don't we just go to another part of this continent? It's much safer, much less risk. Why are we going to go to a whole other region if we can just have this whole market share to capture? That's a great dialogue for your company to have. So you begin to think about where you're going to go, you know, the vision part of it. And I've seen these things grow up into lots of interesting examples of uh, mountains. We did one about a year ago where the, the CEO, in, in, interestingly enough, drew, the, drew a mountain and he drew a snowball and he was pushing the snowball up the hill. And he was hoping to get to a couple plateaus, but he wasn't sure if he could get there or not. And he was, he was scared to death that that snowball was going to roll back down over him and eat him up on the way back down. So what did that company end up working on? Infrastructure. They were, they were so single-threaded in many areas that that snowball was going to overwhelm them. They needed to build process and build structure and build infrastructure because they had a lot of business. They just didn't have the infrastructure to support that. Uh, I've seen people do um, uh, airplane, airport scenes, and then they've, they've actually seen the fighter planes and bombers come in and drop bombs on them. That was the competition. You begin, and again, it's fun, it's exciting, and it really gets you to paint the picture of where you're going to be in the future. So once you draw that out, then you have to say, gosh, there's a long ways from that organograph on what's working and how it's working, you know, that really honest assessment of where we are, to this future, this future look for our company. We've got to analyze the gaps. So remember what we've done now. We've got We've got a list of what's working, a list of what's not working, and then we have a list of things we need to do to jump that chasm, right? To get from where we are yesterday to where we want to be a few years down the road. So you've got three, three really cool lists of things you, you can potentially work on. But can you work on them all? Uh, that's the trick, right? Now we've got to figure out what we need to work on. Just a warning here about the process. It's really important that you, once you jump into something like this and you're beginning to commit your company toward it, is that you commit to it, the leadership needs to commit to it, and then the people, on uh, people inside the company need to commit to it too. Um, the worst thing you can do as a leadership team is kind of take on these kinds of things and then come back. Uh, you may have committed to your staff that you're going to make two or three changes in a year and you, you don't do them. And you, you begin to lose credibility as a leadership team. Y you begin to wonder why the next time you ask for help, whether it's on a proposal or whether it's on some other business initiative, you kind of, instead of having these, these empowered hands that reach out and help you, you get the alligator arms, right? We, well, last time we asked, they asked us to do this, they didn't really follow up on it. So the commitment to the process is really important. I'd like you to think of it in three different perspectives, right? I'm a big fan of any change that's successful, you need to have an emotional connection to it. To it. Let me give you an example for this group. Uh, I used to run uh, uh, a company that was the, the Boeing part uh, of Maryland, in, in, uh, up the uh, other, other side of the river. And um, we were having troubles recruiting. I looked out my window one day and Lockheed Martin had a tent the size of this building and it was the recruiting fair out in their parking lot. So I took pictures of that tent and took them into the next uh, leadership meeting and saying, 
this is emotional to me. This is who we have to compete with. We have to compete with Barnum and Bailey putting up the tent and really rolling out the show for potential recruits. It's a very competitive market. I had to make it emotional for these people, for the for folks on my leadership team, because they weren't sort of getting it through spreadsheets and analysis. We had to find ways to make it emotional. Another example. Um, in a previous company, we, we, uh, we, the CFO came in one day and uh, told us that the average billing rate for our company was less than what we paid the clown at the uh, summer picnic. So it was the average billing rate that our master's degree engineers were, were charging was less than the, the clown charges for one hour at the summer picnic. So, he, so we said, oh my gosh, this was a, quite a revelation. This is embarrassing. How can, how can master's degrees engineers charge less than the clown? So we had him come to the next uh, all hands where we began to present this kind of stuff. And he came dressed up as Bozo the Clown. Nose, hair, big shoes, the whole deal. And the mantra from that company became, every time we bid a project, we, we could not go below the clown rate. So that was our emotional connection to try and, and, and I'll tell you, in six months, we dropped a ton of money to the bottom line because we weren't going to be beat by the clown. You know? It was just a way to connect emotionally. So I would suggest, once you begin to initiate these changes, find ways to get in people's bellies. Find ways to connect to them. Find an emotional connection because the logic, which is point number two, the intellect, doesn't always work. I think you start with the emotion first and then support it by the spreadsheets. Support it by your graphs, support it by your PowerPoints, because then the engineer is really going to say, I think it works. Ah, I know that'll work now. And then follow up with the spiritual part about it. And that's the legacy part. So it's the kind of conversation you say, uh, when you're talking to your grandchildren or your children a uh, number of years from now, you say, you know, mom or dad, what were you doing in this great business time of the early, the early part of this century? In uh, 2008, what, what were the great things you guys were doing? I read about it in my history books that it was an exciting time in U.S. business. Well, if you have the pregnant pause, you sort of missed out on it. You have to find a way to make the work you're doing uh, a legacy work. It's a kind, of, kind of a spiritual connection to you. It's emotional for you. It's exciting for not just you, but your leadership team. So connect emotionally, support that intellectually, and then and run it in to make sure it's a spiritual, long-term connection for you guys. So that's a commitment to the process. So where have we been? We've analyzed where we are. We've talked about where we're going to be. And now, which is actually the hard part, is how we're going to get there. So the first thing we have to do is choose the right path. Choose the right path. That that's, sounds a lot easier than it is. Um, you know, if you don't know where you're going to go, it's very difficult how to get there. So what we're trying to do is find the best way and the best path for us to get there. We're going to create on this list things that work, things that aren't working, and the gap, things that we have to do to get to fulfill our vision. Some of those are going to be uh, important, but not urgent. Some of them are going to be transformational. Uh, some of them are going to be uh, incremental. Now the trick is to sort of figure out which ones they go on. I'd like you to think of it in terms of a future curve and a present curve. You can't do everything. Some of these things can be, once you begin to work this list, some of the things can be put on the present curve. That may be maybe part of your jobs as leaders in the company. Uh, maybe people that work for you. Give them a job that's incremental. Um, think little things that are going to help, that are operationally, they're going to increase operational effectiveness. The future curve is a better way to think of the transformational things. Things you're going to try. Things that might not always have the, things are going to have a powerful return on investment, but they're not always going to work. But they're going to lift your company up. They're going to change the nature and the status of your company. So think in terms of having a present curve and a future curve. Because the building of the operation effectiveness is, is, is important to know that it's necessary but not sufficient for you to gain a premium value in your company. You've got to do these things, but in order, to, in order to be considered a market leader or to gain a premium valuation, you need to kind of do the things in the future curve which are going to get you to that spot. So I'm going to ask you to kind of narrow these things down and create what we call transformational initiatives. And those are the things that fit on the future curve. You're going to keep track of the little things on the present curve, but you're going to really tack and change your company things are going on the future curve. So what's a transformational initiative, and why do we call it that? Because it's going to change your company. It's a, it's, a, it's a big leap that you're taking for your company. It may take you six months to do it. It may take you 18 months to do it. It may take you 36 months to do it. But it's a big initiative that you're trying for your company. And I'm going to suggest that you only do three. Only do three. I'm going to allow you to only to choose three. Because what we've experienced is that you do, if we've done this over and over and over, when a leadership team comes away from a planning session or an offsite, if you have six, seven, eight, 10, 12, 15 initiatives, none of them get done. And it's a great way to lose credibility in your team. It's a great way to begin to sort of lose energy on transformational things. Pick three. Pick three that work really, 
well for you. And Matt, let me show you how, how you may consider that. One of the exercises that the, the book will take you through is to go through a risk and reward sort of scenario, where you begin to, to look at the initiatives. If you may have picked out eight or 10. And we're going to ask you to go through what's, what has the biggest impact at the risk that you're willing to take. So in this chart, on the bottom right hand is the positive impact, and the top is risk. So the very far uh, right hand corner, it's you're analyzing. Positive impact, but the risk is really high. You know it's going to be great for your company, but you're not sure if you can handle the risk. So again, it's not just you analyzing this. It's the entire leadership team. People are all engaged in this. You're, you're building teams to do this. The top right hand corner is desirable. High impact, low and medium, but that's not always the real world. Uh, it would be perfect if you, if you went through this exercise and you found three things in there. They're low impact, low risk, and you're going to just hit a home run with them. Chances are they're not there. You're going to find yourself in the analyzed world more, more than not. And you want to make sure that the uh, undesirable and not worth doing, review them. Maybe they're good projects for more junior people uh, that you can sort of keep track of. But there are things that you don't necessarily always want to pay a ton of attention to. The last thing about uh, creating these, about kind of where we're going to go, is mo maintaining momentum. I'd like to begin to think about this momentum similar to the discussion we had earlier around how you're going to think about it as an emotional or an intellectual or a spiritual connection. The mind, body, and soul in your company, you're the mind. You're the leadership. People in your company are making decisions. That's the mind. That's the leadership of the company. The body is a process and structure, things that you do. Program management, organizational structure, governance issues, anything you have, that's the body of the company. The soul is your culture. What kind of culture do you have? Uh, do you have a culture of execution uh, where you actually get things done? Not kill people, but do you actually get things done? Do you make sure that once a, a task is assigned, people are on top of it? It's really good to try to think these things through because um, should you come away from these planning sessions and you have a lot of things to execute, if you don't have an execution culture, generally they'll just fritter away. So the trick is, and this is the leadership here, this is all about leadership, is maintaining momentum. So, the way I think of things is that they all, everything falls into the mind, the body, the soul, any kind of change activity, any kind of thing you're trying to accomplish, and you, they all have to move at the same time. There's a big rubber band around these things. So over time, if, you have, if, you ha if you're trying to make an organizational change and you don't address the cultural side to it, that rubber band's going to bring the other guys back. If, you don't, if the body and the soul get out in front of the mind, the leadership has not kind of bought, put their hands around it, or the leadership, maybe you haven't developed, maybe you haven't gotten better leadership skills over the last couple of years, it's all going to slide back. If you haven't changed the culture, if you're trying to change structure and process, and you're trying to do different things among your leadership, if you haven't changed the culture or adapted the culture, it's all going to sort of slide back. So this is the momentum part. We've talked about gaining, or we've talked about creating transformational initiatives. If you don't pay attention to the mind, the body, and the soul, uh, it, it will not work. Um, I talked to uh, somebody earlier and, and they said, well, give me some examples of how this has worked in the past. A year ago I did uh, a value building process with a company and I have to tell you, after the project was over, and you've probably had this, I was so excited to get in there at the beginning, uh, and once I got my he head under the hood, it was like, how fast can I get out? Right? It was really a dysfunctional company. I thought for sure after we created the three transformational initiatives, that this company was not going to ever be able to execute. And I, and I actually sort of ran for the, that project was over and I sort of moved on because I didn't really want to be too much a part of it. I just knew it wasn't going to work. Well, bad on me. Uh, November 1st of this year, the CEO calls me and said, she said, you have to come in and, and see what we've done. Uh, they've moved a new office space. They've made all sorts of changes. One of the big cultural changes they made ar around the, the, the mind and the soul was that they, there's a person in the leadership team that was dysfunctional. Everybody was walking on eggshells around this person and they weren't able to accomplish a lot because that was a sort of passive aggressive person. They let that person go and that was the, something that freed everybody up. Uh, the culture changed immediately, the leadership, the mind changed, and the vision of where they're trying to go, it changed immediately. That company is dramatically different. They had three things they were trying to accomplish. They had, they had established a vision. They kind of knew where they were, the baseline, the assessment of where they, where they, an honest assessment of where they were, and they've done great things in a matter of 18 months. Just great things. And I'm so excited about them, and I'm sort of disappointed that I didn't have the insight to see uh, how they could accomplish this. But I'm very proud of them now, and that they've been able to do these great things. Um, another good example of a company that, that uh, saw these things through is a company that had a software product. Uh, they, they decided that uh, their product uh, needed to have a different uh, sales model. They started off with a very large sales force, and they were selling features 
features and uh, specs, really. They, and they were competing with IBM and other very large companies, and they were a sort of niche company. And after going through this process, what they realized is that they had a customer intimacy model, but they had a product. In other words, they were intimate with their customers, and the only way they could sell their product was, convince, was working with the customer to solve a business problem, not so much getting into a technical shootout with their competitors. So they changed their business model. Instead of having a bunch of bag-carrying salespeople, they changed their sales model to a relationship sale and more business development uh, marketing kinds of people. They changed that whole model. They changed their comp model. And now they, they thought they weren't sure if they were going to live as a product company. And now they have a lot of product sales uh, based on solving people's business problems as opposed to competing in the spec space and the, and the competing with the IBMs of the world. They couldn't do that over there. But they were, they were excited about this because Again, they took an honest assessment of where they were. They began to think of what drives value in their company. They, they believed in the fundamental value of their product. But what they also realized is that there was no way they could be a five in this. Remember that channel, that sales channel area? There's no way they could be a five there. And they needed to be a five there if they were going to try to sell uh, against IBM and others. So they changed that model. They were already intimate with their customer base. So they decided to just shift the company that way and go to a relationship sell based on their software. And now they sell software and services around solving a business problem. It's been a very productive. They've gone from about $4 million in revenue to about $25 million in revenue in a two-year period. It's a very good success story. So one of the reasons I'm telling you those two stories is they stuck with it. I, I have another story to tell you about a company that didn't stick with it. We've went through the same, similar sort of process. And during the process, we came up with uh, it's a company is about $15 million in revenue. And we came up with $800,000 in G&A and expenses during the process that they should jettison. They should get rid of it. They should get rid of two of their business units. It's a $15 million company with like five business units. Uh, they decided at the time they should get rid of two business units. And guess what? They didn't follow through on that. So now they're really struggling. And they continue to struggle as a company because they have five, instead of three really strong business units, they've got five average business units. And they're just barely, barely making it. Um, most of it's leadership driven. Most of it's not following through. And now what's happened to the company is they've sort of lost confidence in the leadership team. It, 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 because they made this decision, they just didn't follow through on it. So their off-site euphoria turned into, oh, didn't we say we we're going to do this? So those are three kind of real world examples of going through the process, again, understanding where, where we are, really, really honest assessment. Of, of where we are, valuing that, valuing that spot in the marketplace. All these companies did exactly these things. They built a contour map that, so that they knew how they worked. So they found the warts and they began to agree with what the good things and the bad things were going on in their company. They did this organograph and they listed exactly how they, how they were going to go to market. They knew where they were going to go. They went through the visioneering exercise and saying, uh, this, is, this is the mountain we're going to climb. Or this is the uh, continent that we're going to go to next. Or, or this is the place that we're going to be strongest in over the next five years. They did an analysis of the gaps. They began to commit to the process. When they committed to the process, they got everybody excited about it. They talked about why this is an emotional issue for us, why this is an intellectual exercise for us, and why this is a, a legacy or spiritual exercise for us. They really began to commit. They, then they began to figure out what's the right path to do this. We had a question the other day is during sort of economically tough times, should you do something like this? And I said, if you do it in the best of times, you must do it in the toughest of times. Because why? You have limited resources. You only can spend so much. Why in God's name would you be spending money on things that don't drive value? And you see it over and over and over again. Um, people, don't, people spend money on initiatives that don't add to the enterprise value, don't build value. So it's not just important to build operational effectiveness. You have to do that. It's sufficient, but not, it's necessary, but not sufficient. You have to continue to build operational effectiveness, but you have to create these transformational initiatives to make sure, remember that future curve? You've got to keep that present curve incrementally going, but the future curve is what's going to change your company. And then finally, you've got to find a way to maintain the momentum. Think about how you do that now. Do you, do, do you follow up at your weekly status meetings? Are your leadership meetings monthly? And do you stay on track on the things that your people committed to you? Are you on top of that thing? Do you, have you looked back at your last few strategy meetings and your last few offsites? Do you have a mechanism to maintain momentum and follow through with things? It's, it's time consuming and challenging, but it's not hard. As we went back to before, none of this is rocket science. None of this stuff is actually uh, uh, will, will, is, is sort of like re reinventing anything new. But what it is is a, a planning process that takes into consideration value. T back to that conversation earlier on. What do you value? 
How do you value it? Do you know the value of it? So you've come out of this now saying, I'm getting a feel for what might make my company more valuable. I could consider thinking about doing this. Um, I'm, I, I'm beginning to consider where we want to go. I'm not sure if everybody on my leadership team knows where we want to go, so I think I need to think that through. And by gosh, I'm really not sure if everybody on the leadership team knows how we're going to get there. So if, you, if I leave you with anything today, it's making sure you and your leadership team have a very honest assessment of where you are, very, very uh, visionary look about where you want to go, and then the entire leadership team on how you're going to get there. And then don't forget the uh, maintain momentum as you go. Don't forget the tools you can use to, to build consensus. And don't forget about uh, having a, making sure it's a very honest and transparent view of your company.